Welcome to Church Online, everybody, and I am praying that God's best blessing rests on your life as we put Him first and realize that we're blessed to be a blessing. And church has been so great. I mean, we started our Don't Quit in the Dip series last week with part one. If you missed it, guys, go back and watch it. I got some friends and on stage with me today, but I want to encourage you, go back. We had the best conference we have ever had in the history of our church. That's also available on our YouTube channel. Like, subscribe, share it. We had John Maxwell, Christine Kane, Darius Daniels, Sammy Rodriguez, and Lisa Turkhurst. Guys, it was phenomenal. And the 18th, guess what? My long-awaited book came out, Don't Quit in the Dip. You can buy this wherever books are sold. And we're in Target, guys. That's how you know we made it when we we're in Target and Walmart and really all wherever books are sold. But my prayer is that this book will help you. This is not just a book. It's filled with really sermons that are going to help point people to Christ and climb out of the dip. And we're going to jump into part two in just a second, so don't go anywhere. Text somebody, tell them to get, get involved in this, this sermon because I believe it's going to help them get out of the dip today. But as we've been saying for so many weeks, we just say pray, give, reach. Pray, give, reach. When people are asking us, what do we do? What do we do? Keep on praying, everybody. Keep on praying. Don't stop praying in this time. And give if you want to give. We never really tell you to give. We simply say pray, ask God what you should do, and then just do that. How great would it be if we just realized the investment we're making in the kingdom of God? We helped some great people in the conference, had some great giveaways locally, nationally, internationally. Thank you for what you're doing because together we could do more and reach more people in this very difficult season. My prayer for you is that you get in a small group. Our small groups launched, you ready? This week. So go to the website and go shopping. And really, you don't even have to shop for what subject matter because we're all doing the exact same small group. It is don't quit in the dip. And I, I, I recorded eight different sermons, really short little messages, episodes, if you will. And what you'll do as a, as a family, as a church, as a small group, you'll watch about 10, 15 minutes of a teaching, and then there's some questions, and you just dialogue and start to talk about it, and you watch as God grows us as a church. This is an all play. This is an all skate. Everybody's doing the same thing. We're going we're gonna to come out of the dip stronger in the name of Jesus Christ. So go shopping right here and right now. Today our message is entitled, Under the Desk. Under the Desk. I want to read an excerpt from the book, chapter 3. And I want to take you back to a moment that, if I could be very vulnerable, it was a painful moment for me. It was an embarrassing moment that I'm trying to convey on these pages for you. But I remember tears streaming down my face as my body was folded up under my desk like origami. I had just preached my heart out that Sunday and was exhausted and overwhelmed. Earlier that week, I had been teaching boldly and now I was hiding from the world, hoping no one would find me like this. I felt at the end of my rope and that that desperation had me crying out to God, barely able to squeak out the words, I can't do this anymore. Find somebody else, I'm done. Under that desk, I felt pressed into a corner. No way out, no hope. I was in a huge dip with what felt like a stagnant church, countless failed strategies, a long battle with my health, a detour after detour with our church location. We were portable for 13 years. I wanted to quit so badly, everybody, but I just kept seeing the faces of the precious people in the congregation. And deep down, I knew there was still purpose for my life, but I just wasn't seeing it. At this particular moment, all I could see is the underside of my desk. Let me ask you a question. Have you been there before? Let me ask you a deeper question. Are you there now? That moment where there's so much inside of you that you would love to do and see happen, and yet it's not happening. And so you find yourself, like I was, under my desk. I was wondering, like, God, if you have a plan for my life, why are you taking so long to reveal it? Like, God, God you're, you're supposed to be good, right? You're good. You're still good, right? Questioning my calling, questioning 
what I'm supposed to do, because I'm not seeing what I wanted to see. I wonder today, if you were honest with yourself, what's the name of your desk? What's the name of the desk that you're under right now, hiding from people, not wanting anyone to see? What is it that you're going through? What's the name of the dip that you're in? It could be marital, it could be relational, emotional, fear, anxiety, depression. What is it where you thought you were going to be doing so much more in life, so much further ahead than you should be right now, but you're not there and you're stuck, plateaued, and you're starting to talk yourself out of believing God for more? Guys, this is why I wrote the book. Don't quit in the dip. Here's what I want to let you know. Jesus sees you in the dip. I'll talk to you about a guy in the Bible named Simon Peter. Simon Peter, I could relate to a lot. He was a hothead, always saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. He probably wished he had peppermint socks because he was always putting his foot in his mouth. You know what I'm saying? That kind of guy. (laughs) Peter was a fisherman. And he was fishing all night long, didn't catch anything. And then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up. And he sees Peter where he is in a dip and calls out to him. You know what I'm really grateful for? Is that sometimes when we're in a dip, we can't see clearly. But you need to know Jesus' eyesight is never blurry. (laughs) He always sees you in the dip. And while sometimes we can't see, Jesus sees you in the dip. He sees you underneath the desk. He sees you in depression. He sees you in fear. He sees you right where you are. You're not overlooked by God. He knows exactly where you are. He knows what you're feeling in life. And he wants to tell you there is more that, that's available. Like all of us are asking the question, is there more? Is there, there's got to be more to life than this? Yes, there is. You just have to climb out from under your desk and see the one who blesses the more. And it's not just more for more's sake, you know. It's, it's more so that we can fulfill our calling and God's calling on our life and reach heaven and tell more people about the love of Jesus Christ. John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, The thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. Can we all agree the devil's doing a pretty good job in 2020? Like he's showing out in 2020. And I'm so grateful that's not where the Bible stops, that verse, because Jesus goes on to say, that's what he came to do. Let me tell you what I came to do. I came to give you life. It's life to the fullest. The message paraphrase says he comes to give you life. It's life. It's real life. It's eternal life. It's more than you could even imagine. So that life is available. And even when you're in the dip, even when you're under the desk like I was, folded up, crying out, questioning everything, wondering if God even saw me. I was hiding from people that that week. I didn't want anybody to see me like that. And maybe you don't want anybody to see you where you are. Maybe you're hiding it pretty good from everybody else. You just need to know you can't hide it from God. He sees you and he runs to you. Jesus looks at Peter in Luke 5. The Bible says that one day Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. The people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. So he's teaching this. He's having church outside. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. Underline that phrase, washing their nets. Jesus is teaching the crowd. They're pushing him back a little bit into the water. He turns around, sees two guys who are not a part of the group. <laughs> and he asks them, hey guys, can I, um, uh, can, can I get in your boats? Now, he sees them, and they're doing something. They're washing their nets. Listen, everybody. When the Bible teaches and and when the Bible is talking to us, there's not filler in the Bible. There are details for a reason. So we have to ask ourselves some questions. Why does it state they're washing their nets? I'll tell you why. Because they're done. They, They fished all night long, did not catch anything, And now they're washing their nets. You don't wash your nets unless you're done. They're done, done. They're finished. And Jesus saw them wrapping up a night's work. And he comes to them and he asks, hey guys, can I get in your boat? I'm going to get in your boat and keep on teaching. Now, they agreed. But if I'm Peter, like, can you imagine Peter's face? 
looking at Peter like, like how long is this sermon going to be? You know, it's kind of some of what some of y'all are thinking right now. How long is this? Ser- how long is he going to talk? Like, I didn't ask to be here. This is not my tour group. Y- you are asking me to get in my boat and teach. And, 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 and I, by the way, the timing of this seems off because Jesus didn't come while they were still fishing. He came when they were finished. Wow. He came when they were done. Yeah. He came, let me say it this way. He came when they came to the end of themselves. So Jesus rolls up, they're exhausted, their hands blistered, they're washing their nets, and here's this stranger, they didn't know who Jesus was, this random guy, he comes over, he's like, hey guys, uh, I got an idea, let's go back out. Now, if you've ever worked the restaurant industry, it would be like you working at a restaurant, say the restaurant closes at nine o'clock, and then you're mopping up, cleaning, and, and then there's that guy that comes knocking on the window, like, hey, you guys still open? You see me, um, what are you talking about? You see the sign? I'm mopping up right now. We're done. That's what Jesus does. Jesus asks them to go get in the boat. Here's what I love about Jesus. Jesus gets in the boat before Peter did. <laughs> Peter didn't even say yes. Jesus is like, I'm getting in the boat. Can I tell you this? Jesus is always ready before we are. Yes. Wow. Yes. I live in a house with our four daughters and my wife, and I'm always ready before they are. I'm always waiting. I'm like, come on, girls, let's go, let's go. They're doing hair, makeup, they got, they're getting dressed. Di- it seems like Diana doesn't start getting ready until it's time to go. I'm waiting. <laughs> Guys, I have a lot in common with Jesus. He and I are both always waiting. I'm kidding. That's a dumb joke. But the point is, Jesus got in the boat, and he's waiting for Peter to get in position. Let me say it this way. Jesus is always waiting for you to get in position. Yeah. He's ready before we are. He gets in the boat. And in this moment, in this, in this setting, Peter's thinking to himself, how long is this going to be? Like, do we really have to do this now? I'm, I'm like, I just want to go home. I want to check out, punch the time clock and go home. He felt kind of like his nets all washed up. And there are some of you, you need to know the reason I wrote this book, because I felt all washed up. And for any of you watching that feels washed up, you're not alone. Peter felt that way. And he's like, for some reason, I don't understand what it was, Peter agreed. He looked at Jesus and said, all right, come on in the boat. It's fine with me. And Peter, who was on the edge for a while, now gets a front row seat to the greatest teacher the world has ever known. Watch this. He's no longer on the edge. See, Jesus saw Peter in the dip. He saw Peter on the edge. And he's like, Peter, I don't want to just see you from a distance. I want you by me. Jesus sees you on the edge, on the edge of disappointment, on the edge of discouragement, on the edge of despair. He sees you under the desk. He sees you in the dip. He sees you in defeat, and he runs to you and says, I don't want you way over there. I want you to come by me. He brings Peter by him in the boat, starts teaching, and he taught the crowd. And then as soon as he was done teaching the crowd, second service started, and he turned around and had another service just for Peter. Luke chapter five says, and when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out to the deep water. Like, yeah, you you know where you just came from. Let's go back there and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, master, we've worked all night long and we haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Those four words changed Peter's life because you say so. I don't really see it. I don't even know if I believe it. But because you say so. I don't even see how this can happen. I don't see in my mind any rationale why this idea and plan would work. But because you say so. In spite of the frustration, Simon Peter obeyed Jesus, even though he was saying, we've worked all night long already, and we've caught zero, zilch, nada. And can I also add, like Joseph Stowe brought this story to life for me. He reminds us, this is not fly fishing, guys. This is not cast out, really ain't cast out, really. This is heavy, wet, soggy nets that have to be thrown out there and muscled in every time over and over and over and if you're in the boat you just would have pulled an all-nighter you would be frustrated you'd be hungry you'd be cranky because coffee hadn't been invented yet come on everybody 
Like this is an all night shift. And these men had tried so hard in their own strength to fill their own nets. And they came up so empty. Number one, Jesus sees you in the dip. Number two, Jesus sees your emptiness. Jesus sees our emptiness. It's, it's, the, it's, it's one thing if you were fishing and it was just vacation and you didn't catch anything. That's no big deal. Like I've, I've been fishing before, didn't catch anything, and I just made a pit stop on the way home, rolled into the house and told Diana through the spoils on the counters, like, look, I just caught all this at the grocery store, you know? Like, me, man, me catch fish. I can, this is, this is what I do, you know? I like to do most of my fishing at the grocery store, as a matter of fact. Um, here's what I realized, that when you fish at the grocery store, the fish, um, they're not so frightened for some reason. Not really sure why, and, and I don't use as much bait. So, so there's the idea. Like, I throw the, I throw, it's so stupid too. I threw the fish on there. They're still wrapped in like the grocery wrapping, got the sticker on there. I, it's not a big deal to me. I do my fishing there because it's not a big deal. It was just for fun. If this is your livelihood, it's a big deal. Yes. Yeah. Like they weren't just on vacation. They were fishing for their job. And now there's, there's a deficit. They worked all night, did not catch anything. So Jesus saw their nets. He saw their emptiness. He saw where they were. And he looks at him. He's like, so uh, how's fishing? How, how's it going? They're like, it's lousy. And Jesus says, oh, I got a great idea. Let's go back to where you just came from all night and uh, let's let our nets down again. And they say, in re with respect, oh, listen, mister, um, I don't know if you know this or not, but we are professional fishermen. Like We grew up on these waters and uh, if there were any fish to be caught, you better believe we would have caught them already. Yeah. Yeah. So with all that being said, we don't know why, Peter still said, because you say so. Like, like, we haven't caught anything. We've worked all night long, and Jesus is probably thinking, yeah, but you didn't have me in your boat. Right. Come on. Yes. Like, you need to know in your own strength, you're not going to catch anything in life. Jesus wants to come into the boat. He wants to come into your life. Let me say it this way. Proximity to Jesus alters your perception and provision. Yes. <laughs> Let me say that again so you can write this down. That proximity to Jesus alters your perception and your provision. When you enter into a trust relationship with Jesus, when you let him take the controls of your life, you begin to submit your life to him, obey his word. He not only brings a calming, he brings a plan. Oh, come on, clap your hands and thank God today. He brings a, he brings a plan in your life. He brings a calming to your life. He brings a solution to get you out of the dip. And maybe you feel like you've worked hard all your life. Maybe you feel like you've tried everything to, you know to do to get purpose in your life. You've tried relationship after relationship. You've tried to fill your life with a job. You've tried to fill your life with education. You've tried to fill your nets with something else, pleasures of the world, whatever it is, fill in the blank. And you keep throwing the nets out there. Tell me if this sounds true. And every time you pull the nets back in, it still leaves you empty. I wonder, can anybody in the, in the chat right now, just with a, a, an emoji wave hand, let be honest, does it feel like that right now? Where no matter what you're throwing the nets out to, it keeps on coming back empty every single time. Now you're frustrated, now you're empty, you feel tired, and just like Peter, you feel all washed up. This is how we feel in the dip. This is why we wrote the book to help people get out of the dip because maybe you, maybe you are like me under the desk. Maybe you're like Peter and the fishermen and you come to a point where you're so frustrated. Here's the problem with frustration. It never stays put. It always slips into despair to the point where now you're screaming, I'm done, I'm done. I'm done with my marriage. I'm done with my job. I'm done with life. I'm done with 2020. And other people try to talk you into believing God for more, and all you can say is, I'm done. You used to be full of faith, but now I'm done. I used to think there was more, but now I'm done. I used to think God could use me, but now I'm done. Do you know what that feels like? 
to be done? When God has promised that there is more still available. Or maybe you're one of those people that your friends try to tell you about Jesus and church and you look at them like the disciples and say, listen, (laughs) with all due respect, I'm a professional. And if there were purpose out there, I would have found it by now. So thank you, but, but no thank you. And many times we blame our emptiness on the spot. That's what fishermen do a lot, right? Oh, the spot's cold. Let's move to another spot. Let's, let's go to another spot so we can maybe get better luck over there. And a lot of times that's what people do, trying to find the more in life. And, and they, they switch jobs. They're like, ah, it's the job. I'm going to move to a different city. I'm going to go from this relationship to this relationship, this boyfriend to this boyfriend to this girlfriend to this girlfriend, over and over, change churches, new spot. And here's what we realize. After doing that for so long, you begin to realize it's not so much about the what or the where, it's about the who. It's about Jesus. Like, there's nobody, there's nothing, there is nothing in life that can deliver the more that you're looking for except Jesus Christ. And isn't it interesting, Jesus took Peter back to the same spot that they had toiled all night long, looking for fish, fishing in their own strength. They thought if there's any fish here, we would have caught them by now. They, Jesus takes them back to the same spot and they catch more fish than they probably have ever caught in their life. Listen, all of this is about obedience to the one who blesses the spot. Let me say it this way. Put yourself in the right place of obedience and God will open up the right door of opportunity. So Peter did. Because you say so, Lord, I don't think I believe it. I don't think I could see it. I don't have the rationale. I don't understand how this is going to take place. But if you put yourself in the right place of obedience, God will open up the right door of opportunity. Jesus sees you in the dip. He sees you under the desk. He sees your labor. He sees the emptiness. He sees you wanting more. And so what happens is Jesus comes along and he says, I'm going to step into your life. If you let me, if you're cool with this, if you invite me in your life, I will step into your life and I will offer you what you've been looking for. Now remember, the disciples were done. They're washing their nets. You don't wash your nets unless you're finished. And they're complaining about all the statistics, all the facts. Isn't it funny how we like to tell God all the facts? Like, I've tried this already. I've, I've been fishing all night. We were out here all night. While you're out getting a nice sleep, we were on the water. And if there's any fish to be caught, we would have caught them by now. We always do the same thing. We list the facts, everything we've tried. And many times we forget that God is saying, you haven't had me in the boat with you. I know you've been doing this on your own, and that's been the problem. And many times God doesn't allow us to achieve what we want on our own, because if we do, we'd forget him. We start to think, I got this. I, got, I don't need God. I got this. Okay, newsflash, everybody. We don't got this. 2020, we don't got this. We need the Lord. And, and if there were more out there in life, we say, God, we could have found it by now. It's not true. Peter said, because you say so. Because you say so. I'll do this. That's the difference. The blessing, the protection, the provision, all of God guiding us, it comes from us inviting God into our life and obeying what he told us to do. Peter obeyed, reluctantly, probably, like rowing back out to shore after a full graveyard shift. Here he is, go to the same spot. The Bible says they caught so many fish, their nets begin to snap. Can you imagine that look of surprise? When, when Peter's there and he looks over at John, their eyes get big, I, I could see them starting to laugh. Like, this is ridiculous. They start to call out to the other friends in the other boat, guys, come over here. We have so many fish. That our nets are about to break. Come on, come help us. There was enough fish for them and their friends. Wow. Let me say it this way. Your obedience to God will end up blessing others. Yeah. Because God blesses you, and out of that blessing, you turn around, and you're now able to bless somebody else to point them to Jesus Christ. This story blows my mind. It's the John 10, 10 principle. Yes, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus is like, yeah, I'm here to give you abundant life. Yes, for heaven. Yes, for eternity, but also down here to point people to me, Jesus is saying. He's a good father. 
Our God is a good Father. Remember his nature when you're under the desk. Remember who he is in the dip, in the trial of life. And remember that his word can lead you out of the dip. Second Timothy says it this way, that all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so the servant of God that you and me may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. How have so many people gotten out of the dip in life? I'll tell you how. By listening to God's word. Matter of fact, on version, the, the Bible app, I have a five-day reading plan called Don't Quit in the Dip. Yeah. Go start there. Yeah. It's, just, yeah. it's just a little kickstarter, just to kind of get you on a springboard into a devotional life every single day, and I'll help you, okay? Share with your friends who are going through a dip. Buy the book for somebody who's going through a dip, and we're going to help them climb out of this dip. Yes. Right, yep. But the thing that Peter said that changed his life was because you say so. It was never about fish, though, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Oftentimes, we can forget the provider and just look at the provision. Yeah. And, and Peter understood now, it's not just about the fish. Yeah. See, Jesus sees you in the dip. Jesus sees your emptiness. But Jesus also sees the real need. Yeah. The real need is not just provision. The real need is relationship yeah. with the one who can provide. Right. It's Jesus Christ. Immediately after catching the fish. Peter knew this is no ordinary man. Peter, he's stunned. He falls to his knees in humility and looks at Jesus and says, there's no way I should even be in your presence right now. I'm a sinful man. I can't be here. And this is Jesus' response. Jesus comes and he sees the need. He sees the empty nets, which Peter's now connecting the dots that Jesus did this incredible miracle because Peter's a fisherman, so Jesus did an illustrated sermon to help him realize that the nets don't just represent his livelihood, it represents his life. Jesus is coming and stepping in saying, Peter, I know just like these nets are empty, your life has been empty. You've been searching for purpose in the monotony of life, and I'm here now. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Peter falls to his knees and says, I'm unworthy, leave me. And Jesus the kindness that only a Savior can offer, offer. He says, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Wow. Underline a few phrases. Don't be afraid. From now on, he says, you're going to fish for people. Pulled their boats ashore. Underline this phrase. They left everything to follow Jesus. Jesus saw Peter fully. Peter's sin was not hidden from Jesus, and yet Jesus didn't condemn him either. Right. It's like John 3, 17. Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that through Jesus, the world would be saved. That's his plan. So he called Peter. In this brokenness, in this humility, he reaches down with the kindness that only Jesus can offer, has Peter stand up, and then he begins to prophesy vision into his brokenness. This guy, Peter, was there probably tears streaming down his face. He felt like he was unworthy, felt like he was all washed up, felt like he was in a dip, and Jesus said, yeah, that's how you feel now, but from now on, you're gonna be more than just a fisherman, Peter. From now on, you're gonna be a fisher of people. You and I together, we're gonna intercept destinies. Come on, clap your hands and thank God that he can use you to make a difference in the world. And I love those three little words. From now on, say them with me, from now on, where you are watching from, or type it in the subject line right now, from now on. Everybody, come on. From now on. He, in other words, I know you've been chasing one empty thing after another, but Jesus is saying the same thing that he said to Peter, to you and me today, from now on. I know you might feel empty, but from now on. I know you might be wounded, but from now on. I know you might feel stuck and not growing, but from now on. I know you might feel like you plateaued in life, but from now on. I know you feel like you might be damaged goods and overlooked. I'm telling you from now on, God has a purpose. He has a plan. He has a destiny. I know you might be in a dip or under the desk, but Jesus sees you in the dip. He sees the real need. He runs to you and says, I still want to use you, and I'm going to bless you so you can be a blessing. Somebody shout from now on. Go on, say from now on. From now on. 
You look at where you are. It's not about where you have been. It's about where you will be once we surrender to Christ. He comes into our boat, into our life. And I don't want you to see Jesus like this. See him like this. Helping you climb out of what you have been stuck in for so long. He's calling you to more. That from now on, life can be different. From now on, he's calling you. From now on, you can walk in purpose. From now on, you can walk in fulfillment and abundant life. From now on, don't quit in the dip. (laughs) Peter didn't quit in the dip, thank God. But so compelled was this fisherman that he, he, he saw everything that Jesus did for him. And then the Bible says they came to the shores, they dropped the nets, and then followed Jesus. This is crazy to me, because the very thing that Peter had worked so hard to fulfill was now fulfilled. And his immediate response was to turn around and leave it. Isn't it crazy how many times people will finally reach what they thought would deliver the ultimate satisfaction and fulfillment in life, and they realize it ain't all that. It it ain't all that. While while this might have seemed rash to most people, Peter knew that the only one who could deliver the more that he's been looking for was standing right in front of him. Let me say it this way. Some of you are worried about provision, and you're standing right in front of the provider. Some of you are worried about deliverance and you're standing right in front of the deliverer. Some of you are worried about salvation and you're standing right in front of the Savior, Jesus Christ. He was willing to give up everything. Peter, walk away from the fish. He didn't even say he sold the fish. He got the fish and he turned around and walked away from the fish to follow the one who can deliver more than fish. This is not about seafood, everybody. This is about purpose. This is about coming out of the dip. And I know it would have been easier to walk away from, eat, from empty nets because that would have been no sacrifice at all. Like, ah, there's nothing here anyway. Yeah, I guess I'll follow Jesus. He had just had the biggest catch of his life and Peter turns around and says, I'm going to drop my nets to follow Jesus. Listen to me, everybody. With everything going on and the chaos of our nation and global pandemic, I'm believing for the greatest revival and the greatest awakening to hit our land like never before. And I'm praying. Listen, listen. I'm praying that you have a net dropping moment. I'm praying that you realize how much God has to offer in our life. Heaven as a reward. Jesus as our reward. And purpose down here, I'm praying that some of you understand what a, a net dropping moment would feel like. We, for so long, we've been trying to fill our nets with other things and pleasures and, and job and education and relationships. But you have to realize it's nothing but net. It's nothing but net. There's nothing there. It's empty at the end of the day. And isn't it crazy how sometimes God will allow you to finally get what you thought would bring you fulfillment only to let you realize it's not what you really needed. (laughs) My daughter Alexandra, she says it this way. We had three birthdays this week. She's one of them. And I love you, Victoria. And I love you, Alexandra and Mariah and Hadassah with all of my heart. So proud of you. Listen, Alexandra said this. Sometimes, Dad, we come to God for what we want and we leave with what we need. Woo! Sometimes we come to God saying, this is what I want, but he knows what I need. He delivers what I need. Listen, what what, what we need is Jesus, not more fish. What we need is Jesus, not more stuff. We need Jesus in this last, in these last days. And Jesus, when he comes in your life, he also brings love, joy, peace, fulfillment, direction on how to get out of the dip, hope, and healing. God sees your attempt to try and fill your life up by yourself. He sees you under the desk. He sees you in a dip, and he wants you to know today he's your source, that everything we need is found in Jesus Christ. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life, and Jesus changed the entire trajectory of Peter's life. Just because Peter said, because you say so. Because you say so. Peter 
was in a dip. Jesus lifted him out of the dip, and I'm so grateful Peter didn't quit in the dip. This is more than a book that we've written, guys. This is something that's going to help people with the Word of God to help point people back to Jesus and back to the Word and climb out of the dip. Jesus called him to the needs of people, and Peter, struggling Peter, Peter, who messed up so many times, would go on to become one of the greatest leaders of the early church. He would birth with the other apostles the greatest movement the world has ever known and write books of the Bible that have blessed billions of people's lives. Okay, look, 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 look. I'm almost a. What if Peter just would have said to Jesus after the miracle, thanks for the fish, and went back to his old life? There are moments where Jesus gets our attention. But if you're not careful, your attention is on the provision instead of the one who provides. He is not getting our attention just to give us a snack. He wants relationship with you. And Peter, something burned inside of him. That as he was sitting there in the dip of life, he was willing to leave it all to drop his nets and give Jesus everything. How about you? Are you curled up under a desk like I was? Tears streaming down my face thinking I'm all done, I'm all washed up. Are you in a dip right now in life? Do you know somebody that's in a dip? Maybe in this moment we can, like Peter, say, Jesus, I give you everything. You watch as he calls you to the business of people. Found followers fish. We no longer fish for fish. We fish for people to help them out of the dip. Would you bow your heads with me? I know you're watching this, our global family all over the world. And maybe you're here and you, you need to remember Jesus sees you in the dip. Jesus sees your emptiness, and Jesus sees the real need. Would you in this moment just tell the Lord, I give you my life. I'm willing to drop my net to follow you. The nets could be different. I'm not saying everybody needs to quit their job. I'm just saying for Peter, there was something he had to leave. What is it in your life that you're holding on to that we should drop so we can follow Jesus? Just ask God right now, what is that, Lord? He'll show you. Now, if this is your heart, pray this with me. Come on, team, pray it out with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me first. Today, I give you my life. I follow you because you say so. From now on, I will not be what I have been. I will be who you've called me to be. Help me climb out of the dip. Be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me from my sin. Wash me clean. And help me to make the biggest difference I can. In Jesus' name. Let me pray for you. Lord, I pray for everybody watching today who's in a dip. My heart breaks because I was there. And with this book, Lord, I've tried my best to try to put down on paper my experience and the portions of your word that helped me out. I pray that now you would bless this group of people watching, help them not stay stuck for one more day. And Lord, we pray right now for all the people that are suffering from the fires here in Northern California. I pray that you would bless them, protect them and their homes, their belongings, Bless the firemen who are working so tirelessly. I pray that you would help bring an end to this in the name of Jesus. Bless them so they could be the biggest blessing they could be. Let them know they're coming out of the dip in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's clap our hands for everybody who prayed that prayer today. Great job. Oh, I'm so proud of you. If you, if you prayed that prayer, text the number below and let us know that you made that decision today. I'm so thankful for you. So grateful for your decision. It's huge. It's a big deal. And we have had so many people 
raving about the book. And what, when we do the drive through book signings, people are buying three, five, seven. One person bought 15 books. And I'm like, why are you buying so many books? It's just you. I had no idea that God was going to use this book because people are thinking about their friends and family members who are also in a dip that need this book. So buy this. For your college, I mean, parents, your, your college kids and high school kids, they need this book. I mean, the crisis hotline is through the roof right now. Depression and medication through the roof. Kids can't even play sports right now. They're going back into school. They're in a dip. Buy this for them. And who else do you know that needs to get out of the dip? I'm praying that God would use this to bless you, to be brought closer to Jesus Christ. You can buy it wherever books are sold. And I'm so thrilled because this week, guys, we start our small group semester. Everybody's doing the Don't Quit in the Dip curriculum that I have shot personally eight different sessions, eight different episodes, and you're going to watch it on Zoom. So go to our website right now and jump in a small group. They're all doing the exact same curriculum, so just pick one that fits your schedule. Just pick one that fits the day that you want to be on, and then jump in right now. And then let's, let's listen, let's push the book forward and let's begin to be the biggest blessing we possibly could be. I love you. And if you want to give today, we never tell you to give. We simply say, hey, listen, pray, ask God what you should do, <clears throat> obey him, do that. And uh, we always honor God with our tithe first, but I'm so grateful for your generosity. Guys, you're making a huge difference and a huge impact locally, nationally, and around the globe. Don't miss next week for part three of Don't Quit in the Dip.